Well, here we are, and welcome to my slightly injured version of the Friday live stream where we're doing uh, questions and answers, your questions, the best answers I can come up with. The first question we have today is about uh, Jesus and why don't all people get saved? Before I, I ask, let me just talk about the elephant thumb in the room. So like maybe half an hour ago, about half an hour ago, I'm sitting here and I'm working on a future video coming up that I'll be doing on uh, Brandon Robertson's whole like... Um, his uh, Jesus was racist video. Uh, that's coming. That's coming soon. I'm working on it. And I was sitting there working on it and I was fiddling with this this knife that my wife got me. Right? She got me this to celebrate 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. It's it's like an engraved little uh, buck knife. And I'm a guy, so I like knives. And um, I'm fiddling with it. And the thing's crazy sharp. And I swear, I sliced right into like the artery of my thumb, I think. It just like will not stop bleeding. So we just like quickly wrapped a giant wad of tissue paper on it and um it doesn't hurt though because i'm 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 so manly i feel no pain but <laughs> but i do bleed apparently so uh there you go there's my embarrassing moment from today uh so if you see you know i know i, I talk with my hands so you're gonna see it i may as well just get it out there and talk about it so from anonymous this is a question coming in as you guys are loading your questions i'll answer 20 of them today and i'm working on getting a counter up there so we can actually keep track of what number we're on but this is number one and the question is, since Jesus died to save all of mankind, won't everyone be saved regardless of whether or not they place their faith in Christ, just like how gravity still works on everyone, whether they believe it or not? Now, I love this question for a few reasons. Um, let me let me walk it to you backwards in case I'm throwing too much at you too quick here. The idea is, hey, gravity is a law of the universe. It just functions whether you like it or not. You don't have to believe in it. And so isn't salvation going to happen with Jesus like that? And they give two reasons. One, because it's like gravity. It just happens. And then two, because Jesus died to save all mankind. So like, if that's the law that's operating, Jesus has died for all, won't all be saved. Now, we can all probably say that we would like that. We would like that. The question is, does scripture teach that? And let me share with you a scripture that shows that I, I believe this is not the case. Um, I think it's very clear. I don't think this is really debatable, honestly. I, I mean, if and, and I'm very ignorant of something if I'm wrong about this, because it seems abundantly obvious that this is not the case in scripture. So let me read to you a verse and then I'll explain to you what I think was wrong with the reasoning that led, you know, that led to this question, uh, not against the, the questioner themselves. They may be putting their own question forward, somebody else's. It's, this is about getting ideas out there and sort of dissecting them, right? So we'll dissect that idea in a moment. But here it is. This is about uh, Jesus and his mission. So we're talking about John the Baptist transitioning to Jesus here. John chapter one, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify about the light. So, you know, if you say Jesus came to die for all, notice what this says he also came to do for all, that all might believe through him. That's something that he came for. But notice in this same passage, it's not accomplished, right? Just because Jesus does something for all doesn't mean all get the thing he does. And we're going to get into the details here. Verse eight, he was not the light, but came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which come, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world. And, and you might think here too, this is, this is universalism, right? He enlightens everybody. They're all going to get saved, but let's keep reading because you can't take these things out of context. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. So Yes, he did it for all. He does it for everybody, but not everyone receives him. Why? Because man has a choice. You have a decision to make about whether you will follow Christ, whether you will trust in Christ. And that choice is important. It's essential that you make that decision. And otherwise, you do not receive the benefits of his salvation. As we read on, it confirms this. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So you have to believe in his name, you have to receive him, and he will give you the right to become a child of God. But you have a requirement on you. It's not a work that you do, it's a relational, and I like to emphasize this, trusting in Jesus is not just an intellectual decision based upon a religious conclusion to an argument. It's a relational choice. It's like when someone proposes marriage to you, it doesn't mean you're married. There's a decision you make to say yes. Yes, I want you. And there's a decision here. And John 1's big on this. John chapter 1, it talks about the whole difference between like light, dark, all these things. And John, uh, 1 John 1 gets into it as well. The idea is that you have to make a decision to follow Christ. So 
yes, he does it for all, but only those who choose Christ receive the benefits of what he does. It's like me making a meal and inviting all my neighbors. Only those who show up get to participate in the meal, even though I made it for everybody. Same thing, same thing here. Um, so what's the problem with the whole like argument from analogy, which is, this is a key thing. I want us to know this because I, I've seen it with a lot of wrong theological conclusions is their arguments from analogy. What do I mean? Here's the analogy. The analogy is gravity pulls us down whether we believe it or not. And gravity applies to all. Jesus, he dies for all. So isn't there like an analogous, analogous relationship between Jesus here and gravity? You'll get pulled into his salvation whether you like it or not. I don't think that works because we don't ever create theology from analogy. We use analogies to explain. We don't use them to establish truths. And I think this is a good principle in life. This is just like a clear thinking principle, at least that I, I never hear anybody talk about, but I think that a lot of people do it without, without saying it out loud. You use analogies to explain facts. You don't create facts with analogies. This is how the Mother God cult, which I recently have a video on, another one uh, I've done on that, interviewing a, a dad who lost his daughter to that cult, and hopefully God will uh, restore that family. But the um, the way they argue is they say, hey, every, every uh, offspring, every human has a father and a mother. If God's our father and we're his children, then it stands to reason analogously, right, that we have, a, we have a God, the mother as well. So they create like a whole new deity out of an analogy, not scripture, just analogy. Analogies are too flexible. Analogies are great for explaining things. They're not for proving things. It's just to help us understand, to grasp a reality. So that's why I wouldn't go down that route. Uh, our next question comes from Colin who asks, why couldn't energy be infinite? Considering we as Christians believe in an infinite God, the reason I'm asking is because the biggest atheist objection I get to the Kalam while evangelizing is that one, energy can create a universe and then in quotes or in a parentheses, you put quantum fluctuations. And two, energy may be constant, infinite. Can you object to these claims thoughtfully? Um, let me see, Colin, I think that, well, okay, partly... Off the top of my head, I'm, I'm gonna. I would want to go and actually, if like, let's put it this way: if you were the atheist who came to me, Colin, right now, and you said, "Here's my objection to the Kalam," I would then go and spend some time on the side re-studying the topic of, um, of, of. Yeah, hold on. I was just thinking about a physicist <laughs> that you might want to look into. Um, I'm not sure if he has stuff on this, but um, oh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. So maybe, maybe if the Lord gives me his name, I'll, I'll give it to you. But um, what I would say is go back and restudy the specific topic to come up with a thoughtful answer. Um, so he says energy can be infinite. It sounds to me, let's just talk about the issue here to get clarity on it, that your, your person who's opposing you or not opposing you personally, but opposing the argument here for God, that they're, they're saying um, energy can be infinite in, in time, like infinitely existing. It could just exist forever. And because in the quantum realm, maybe they'll say like physics breaks down, which is a really cute way of saying nothing um, <laughs> when it comes to quantum physics. Um, I don't think that I would grant that. That doesn't seem rational. That doesn't seem true. Uh, secondly, energy itself, if it's infinite in time, then it can also be infinite in power. Is that what's being implied here? So l let me say this, Colin, here's a great response. Ask your friend a bunch of questions. Clarify that he's not using equivocation when he says energy can be infinite. Does he mean infinitely powerful or infinite in existence? Um, explain how he validates that, what he means by that, what he thinks about the creative power of energy. Ask him why universes aren't popping into existence all the time. Ask him if he has any anyone to support his claims. Then I'd look into this stuff in more detail. Uh, William Lane Craig has done some specific stuff on this topic dealing with quantum science, that kind of stuff. Um, and he's written papers on it. So I would just be, I would just Google William Lane Craig and this specific issue, uh, quantum um, stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> check that out, Colin. There you go. I said stump the pastor or stump me in my, uh, in my video title. And part of the reason for that is because you guys can stump me. Like, like I don't know everything. And I'm giving you permission to ask questions that I may or may not actually know the right answers to. I think it's a healthy relationship for us to have when I can just be real 
and you can be real. So there you go, Colin. There's some thoughts. Um, I don't think that it's rational or any reason for me to assume that quantum a quantum vacuum could create the universe. I think that's strange. I don't think we either also have a reason to assume that quantum vacuums are can be eternal. And why wouldn't universes be popping out all the time then? It, you, you create an artificial limit. It, but it's a little bit much for me to try to weigh in on. So I want to point you towards others. Stranger in Moscow says, The Bible says that Jesus became sin who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21. You also mention it at times in your videos. How can Jesus become sin? Let's look at this because I, I think the verse will help us a little bit. Interesting question. So um, how does Jesus become sin? Here's the verse. He made him, he speaks of God the Father, right? He made him, speaks of Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. One of the first things I'll notice here, um, you, you can notice the italics. We're looking at the NASB right now. Here's the ESV. We'll notice these italic words, two and B. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. That means those words are added by the translators. Good translations will often um, use italics to just let you know we're adding these words. It doesn't mean they're making stuff up. It means these words aren't in the Greek, two and B, right? Uh, they're not in the Greek here, but we're gonna put them in the English for your benefit because we think that you need it to understand. The ESV, here's another uh, version, says, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The ESV is not as strict with their use of italics as the NASB, so they don't bother doing it here. But you can, it's basically the same thing. Here's an NIV. What I'm doing for you guys is modeling reading uh, the same uh, verse in different translations. I think that this is a helpful way for us to understand things. And the um, NIV, let me fix the framing there, says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now the NIV, they're more of a flexible translation than the ESV or an NASB. And so they they realize the wording doesn't say Jesus had no sin. It says he knew no sin. But they think to get the English, it seems, to get the English speakers, modern English speakers, to understand the meaning here, they translated had no sin, which I would say is true. Jesus didn't have sin. Now, what does it mean? No, you know, giving you now some moments to ponder the passage. I'll just go back to the NASB randomly here for no particular reason. Um, I want you to notice this. There's a parallelism. In whatever sense Jesus became sin, right, or was sin, in whatever sense he did that, there's a parallelism in the very verse we're looking at. We became the righteousness of God in him. So in whatever sense Jesus became sin, we became God's righteousness. Now, my understanding, being um, being very much a Protestant, Right, but but also thinking that the doctrine of justification, as understood, right in the Reformation, that that's that's right, that there re that really is the correct understanding of justification. Um, I think we want to have a robust and thoughtful understanding of it. And justification is not the only thing we think about when we think about our salvation in Christ, but it's an important piece. Um, when I look at that, I think of, of imputed righteousness. Right, I I actually have His righteousness given on my behalf in the sense that I am now looked upon as if I were righteous. Okay, so that's the sense in which I become God's righteousness. That it's not my works, it's his righteousness. God is, is perfect and holy, and he's sort of placed that holiness upon me. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all my actions are holy and I am doing those good things. It means that I'm counted as if I was righteous. Jesus, then, if he's the parallel of this in the first part of verse 21, then it makes sense. You're like, oh, so... Just as though I'm, in a sense, clothed with the righteousness of God and God looks upon me and sees me as holy and blameless, Jesus was clothed with my sin. He was given my shame, my guilt. It was, he didn't actually sin, and the verse suggests this. He knew no sin. He had no experience with sin. But he became sin, or he simply was sin on our behalf in the same way that we're the righteousness of God. So this is imputation. My sin was taken from me and placed upon Jesus, and he suffered the punishment. That's the only way he could be punished is if he was clothed with my sin. And then the only way I could be forgiven is if I'm clothed with his righteousness. So I think this is like a, very much about the the Protestant understanding of justification. So the Catholic understanding of justification sees this more as um, imbued righteousness, like God's when it says we become the righteousness of God, the idea is that we are, um, is my understanding, and I have really read on this, th their understanding is that we we like get God's righteousness sort of instilled in us in a way that is 
um, in our character. My character, my, I'm actually good like that, like God is good. But the problem here, if you have that view, that that's the Catholic view, then that hurts the parallel because now you're suggesting that, that Jesus' character actually became sinful. And so I think the Protestant view makes better sense of this passage. Um, all right, so we have our next question from Mark H. He says, around 400 AD, what were the biggest changes in, in doctrine that Jerome introduced in his first Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible? And how did they differ from the original gospel? Um, I don't know how to answer that question, Mark. I can, I can only, I only know tidbits about Jerome and the stuff going on in the Latin Vulgate. Like I can mention one um, in Ephesians where it talks about marriage um, being a mystery. Let me, let me take you to the passage. I'll mention one real quick here. So when it speaks about husbands and wives, and it talks about instructions to husbands, instructions to wives, and then it makes the parallel that husbands and wives are like Christ in the church, it then concludes in verse 32, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying it refers to Christ in the church. Right? What, what mystery is he talking about? He's, he's talking about the idea that a man leaves his father and mother, holds fast to his wife. The two become one. This is this wonderful mystery, but he's explaining what the mystery is. In Paul, when he talks about mystery, he's usually talking about something that was unknown or not fully understood in the Old Testament, but which is now fully understood in light of Christ. He's doing the same thing here, I think, right? The gospel itself, Paul talks about, was a mystery, this thing that was unknown, and then it was later fully understood um, in light of Christ. It was a mystery. And so then that's why he tells the Romans, like, I I've been longing to write to you my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It's not like it's not still a mystery. It was a mystery. It's a solved mystery, so to speak. So I think he's using this the term the same way here. Um, a man leaves his father. Hey, guess, guess what? This is really about Jesus in the church, right? And the, there's a whole picture of Adam and Eve in the garden that is just Jesus in the church. He goes to sleep, right? And then a piece of him is taken out and formed into the woman. Jesus, he dies. Sleep is a euphemism for death. He dies for us and he's pierced in his side and out of his side, blood and water pour out and the church is born of the blood and water of Christ. And so we are his bride. He purchases with his death. He gives us a piece of himself to be, it's beautiful. This, this I think is part of this mystery. Now, Jerome in the Vulgate he translated this mystery word uh, wrongly, and he translates it as as a sacrament. Now, later on, marriage over time, this didn't happen right away, but over time, marriage more and more became an official sacrament in the Roman Catholic sense. It took many, many years. It didn't even happen just, but Jerome's mistranslation here is one of the reasons why they would say, see, it's a sacrament. It says here in Ephesians 5.32. Now, you might be like, well, why is that important? Well, so the official Catholic Bible was the Latin Vulgate, was Jerome's translation. And even in the Council of Trent, the, the Roman Catholic Church affirmed this is like the official Bible of our church. And so it wasn't like, hey, let's go to the Greek, let's go to the original text. That was kind of the cry of the Reformation. They were like, to the source texts, we want to go right to the originals. But the response from Trent and from... Um, what was going on back then is, hey, no, 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 the Latin Vulgate is our text. Basically, they were kind of like modern King James Version only people are kind of what the church was like with the Latin Vulgate in some places back in the day. So uh, the Catholic Church. So yeah, there's one example. Now, I'm sure there's other things, um, but I think probably by and large, his translation is probably pretty good. So I'm not trying to create a conspiratorial mindset. There's just one thing that's come up in my study on marriage and divorce. This passage came up and the history of it came up and it it was important in my study there, uh, so I mentioned it. So there's something to think about, Mark. Um, is, did he change the gospel itself? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I also haven't studied that much into the Vulgate to give you an answer there. So Nero Manser has a question. What does Paul mean specifically by impure in Ephesians 5.5? 5? I can't find anything at all that clearly defines this. I would love to know what Paul as a Jew meant exactly by, the, by this term. Well, let's just look at it together and see if we can... Uh, we can learn something. Let's see here. Verse 5 says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is, covetous, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If he's sexually immoral or impure. Well, let me do. Um, what I, I use Logos Bible software. That's the software I'm using right now. And I find it very helpful. Uh, let me do what's called an exegetical search. So we'll look at Ephesians 5, verse 5. 
and we'll just look at it together. Okay, I don't normally do this because it can kind of bog down the live stream, but here's, and the text is gonna be a little small. I'll make it slightly larger, um, help a little bit. I, I can't, if I make it too big, I won't be able to navigate it very well myself. Um, so here's uh, here's the Ephesians 5.5, 5. here it is in the Greek, right? And here's what's nice about your free promo for Logos Bible Software. Um, the word impure, I could see, uh, akathartos, okay, so I click impure, and I can look at the word itself, look at a lexicon, it, it expands a little section here about the word itself. And let's look at BDAG. Now, BDAG, BDAG is abbreviated for a particular resource that is considered generally to be a very good, solid resource when it comes to um, understanding Greek. It's like a standard lexicon, they call it. So it gives a list of different possible definitions. It even mentions places in scripture where that possible definition is being used. So one is to that which might not be brought into contact with the divinity. Okay, this is probably more usage in more Old Testament context, I'd imagine, um, to its moral impurity. And I, I'm just immediately thinking that's likely what he's doing. Yeah, in fact, here's Ephesians 5.5, 5, um, where they suggest that the moral impurity is what he means there. So one could be more ceremonial impurity. That is a definition that is used. That's the first definition that BDAG lists. But the one that probably corresponds, at least this is just cursory study like I you know you might want to study in things in more detail than just a little quick Q&A thing I'm giving you now um, but the idea here is it's probably pertaining to moral impurity and that's at least what BDAG thinks is happening in Ephesians 5 5 and you could look up other resources and check those out as well that being said the word itself isn't giving us any sort of special unique indication right so for everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, I'm thinking that impure is just moral impurity. Just moral, general moral impurity. Now this immediately raises everyone's anxiety level, right? Because when you read the whole text and you th and you take this as, it's a list, right? What I didn't say out loud is it's a list. There's sexual immoral, that's one thing on the list. The next is impure, which would just be morally, in moral impurity, you're doing moral wrong things. Or covetous, that would be like an internal attitude of covetousness. Um, and that these three groups have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now I get this is creates anxiety. Paul acts like a life with Jesus is a changed life. He really does. And I think we should too. And he's saying if you're living, and I think I, think I would add the word lifestyle here. I think when you look at all the context of all the passages in the New Testament that deal with this issue, you don't want to take one verse out of context. We look at 1 Corinthians. Paul clearly thinks that there's such a thing as a carnal Christian. He uses the term, right? But, but he also thinks that in general, there's a nice little rule of life that if you're living a sexually immoral lifestyle, if you're living a morally impure lifestyle, if you're living a lifestyle of covetousness, and this is this 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 is um, definitive of your character. It's not like you occasionally fail. It's definitive of who you are. That you have reason to wonder about your own salvation. And I don't like that. But it's too important for us not to point out, and to be honest with, and all of us to be looking at your own life and just be like, I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. In fact, the next thing he says, look, I don't want to sugarcoat things that the scripture is warning us about. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partners with them. It's clear from Paul's writings from the New Testament that you can be a Christian who has a significant amount of sin in your life. But it's also clear that you can simply be unsaved because there's a significant amount of sin in your life and it's revealing that you're unsaved. When I meet a Christian who's not living a generally Christ-focused life, who's living a fairly worldly life, I don't immediately say, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But I might say something Paul did. You know that people who do these things don't inherit the kingdom of God, right? Like this should at least create like uncertainty for you because I can't tell the difference between a Christian who's living regular sinful lifestyle things and one who's just lying about being a Christian. And I don't think Paul could tell either, which is why he would put it out there like this. Hey, don't play these games, guys. Get your life right with Christ and stay right with Christ. Um, the comfort for the backslidden is to return, not to stay backslidden and, and just always feel that no matter how, what's going on in their life, they're still saved no matter what. That's not really... 
that's not really the message I think scripture gives them. So hard words, harsh concepts here. And I know there's those who, no matter how godly you are, you're always fearing you don't, you're not really saved. This isn't for you. Okay. This isn't for you. You just got to realize you, you've just got bad judgment on this issue and trust in the grace of Christ. Right. But for those who are living, really living lives in rebellion to God, that other than you're, you're, you naming the name of Christ, there's nothing in your life that says you're truly Christian. Um, that you got to wonder if you're truly Christian. Um, let me let me mention to you guys real quick, our question time, we've got all the questions. I've got all 20 questions for today. So I just want to throw that out there and I'll take the next one um, right now from Derek Beeler who says, I'm currently in a season of waiting on the Lord to know what he wants me to do with my life. Any advice for someone in this season? Um, yes, Derek, my counsel to you would be, first off, just know, I, I know so little about your life and I don't want to make assumptions that could be, you know, the, the fearful thing about giving advice is that somebody would take the advice. Like that to me is the scariest thing. I've watched in, in years and years of life, I've watched where somebody gives counsel to another person and that person goes and lives it out, right? Um, I remember a guy who told me a story, a friend, about how he went to, um, went to Pastor Chuck Smith, who I love and respect. He went to Pastor Chuck Smith and he says, Chuck, should I go and do school for ministry? Or, or, or should I just do ministry? Because I'm serving in the coffee shop at my church right now. And I'm also like doing other things in the church. And Chuck told him, now keep in mind, he went to Pastor Chuck thinking, Pastor Chuck's this great godly man. And whatever he says next, I'm going to do it, right? Because I just trust that God's leading him. Uh, now, Chuck never asked anyone to do that. He never asked people to, to have that assumption going to him. But this is how people feel sometimes when they approach like who they look up to as a godly leader. Whatever they say is going to be from the Lord, you know? And so Chuck told him a general rule he has. He's like, well, I mean, I'd rather have you doing ministry than getting trained. So he was like, I mean, you're already doing it. Just do it. Just do the work. Now, that same guy, my friend, came to me years later and he goes, man, I, Chuck gave me the wrong advice. I, you know, years down the road, I look back and go, I really needed the education more than anything. And it fit my giftings and all these things. And my thought was, I don't know if perhaps Pastor Chuck shouldn't, you know, have, have given him his thoughts there. But I mean, the guy asked, what do you think I should do? It's, there, it's just dangerous. It's just dangerous to give casual advice. So my casual advice to you with all the caveats there in place is what waiting on the Lord looks like in your life is um, doing whatever you can to seek first God's kingdom and righteousness right now, right? Whatever your abilities are right now. Like how do I seek the Lord right now? Um, serve God the best way you can right now. That, that That's it. So when you're confronted with decisions, your decision is, which one serves the Lord the best? Which one benefits the kingdom of Christ the most? I'm going to go for that one. And really think it through. Ask yourself honestly, like which one really does benefit? What use of my time right now is the best investment for that future of benefiting the kingdom of God? Um, waiting is not meant to be a passive thing, I think, for Christians. I think we wait in this active sense. Like as a watchman waits for the morning. Well, a watchman, he's he's out there not sleeping, right? He's waiting on the morning in the same way we wait on the Lord. He, he's he's fighting the sleep. He won't fa fall asleep. He won't fall into worldly things. And until he'll be vigilant and he's keeping watch, taking care of all the tasks he has at hand. That's what I think waiting on the Lord looks like. Yeah. I hope that helps somewhat, Derek. Uh, the, the brunette family says, can a Christian be called, this is question number seven, can a Christian be called to be a governing authority talked about in Romans 13, 1 with all that that its role demands? Does it conflict or contradict with Romans 12, 17 and onwards? Let's look at these passages and let's try and answer this question. So Romans 13 verse one, um, and I do have teaching elsewhere on this passage on the whole book of Romans actually online, but it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now the Christian view, even during persecution, even with a wicked, wicked Roman government is that even even if you don't like the president, even if you don't like the the the, the person who's running your country, right? Because I know that actually over half my audience is not living in the U.S., which is one reason why I don't emphasize U.S. related stuff. But the um the thing is that God is this doesn't mean they're good, but it does mean that God is sovereign over them, and therefore you should submit as as a way of submitting to God's authority. So that's a good thing. Um, we we sometimes, especially in the U.S., we have very very rebellious tendencies towards our government and very um, hypercritical tendencies towards our leaders. That, that's, that's something that's just like a tradition in the U.S. that Christians don't want to be part of really, but that's there. 
Now, the question you have is like, yeah, but can I serve then? Like, let's say that you want to be, become a governor in your city or you want to become uh, the mayor or you want to run for the prime minister or something like that. Romans 12, 17, you say may create conflict here. It says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all people. Okay, I, I get this. Okay. Because government, literally their job is repaying evil for evil. <laughs> like that's part of their task as government. So if I'm, so if I'm here like... Uh, uh, say the say a judge and someone commits a crime and they look at me and they go i thought you were a christian judge and i'm like sentence guilty go to jail for 10 years uh, prison actually if it's that long so how does that how does that work how do i reconcile this well i think that it's, it's just realizing that government has a different role than i do so i personally do not take vengeance but if government doesn't enact the law to do justice they're actually abandoning their responsibility so there's the difference so on an individual level i do not repay evil for evil but if i'm part of government it is actually their job to do justice repay evil for evil but not in a vindictive sense in a in a this is the law this is the appropriate punishment due process and all that kind of stuff so yes can you governmentally be a part of repaying evil for evil in a um godly authority proper authority sense yes while privately if somebody slights you or wounds you or hurts you you give them grace you give them kindness lest you will be overcome by evil i think that's the balance i don't feel like this is a challenging thing at all i think we actually need more christians in government christians please please like pastor is not the only job in the body of christ right there's also like just i don't know being a mailman who's honoring Christ in your life. There's 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 also government positions that we need and people who need to be entrepreneurs and people who who need to like start schools and have like really high quality schooling and or or trade uh craft that they're teaching other people. We we, we need all these things that like Christians need to be all over the place having a godly impact wherever they are. So I think if if you're prone to politics as a Christian, the important thing is that that Christ is the king of your politics. And that's very hard to do in our current culture. Very hard to do. You you may you may lose the election because Christ is king of your politics. That's okay. That's not on you. That's that's praise God for that. All right. Question number eight. Al Naps says, "What would you say is modern day idolatry?" I spend way more time on Christian YouTube channels and my phone than I do reading the Bible or praying. Do you get concerned that people may idolize you? Oh, okay. Several questions there. I'll take. I'll just take them in order. What would I say is modern day idolatry? I think that um, modern day idolatry, I'm going to answer this question in a slightly strange way, is, um, well, it'll seem strange, but I think it's pretty good, <laughs> is, is, is getting like a piece of wood, right, or buying one that has been shaped into the image of some sort of deity or, or being that you're going to then pray to and offer things to and worship. That's idolatry. It still happens today. That is the biblical meaning of idolatry. That is just what idolatry is. Now, there's something that's like that. That's like that, which Paul talks about in Corinthians. And he says, covetousness is idolatry. I, I think we just actually looked at the passage a moment ago. In um, uh, Oh, I've, I've moved things around so much. I, I can't just pop to it. But where he gives a list of things. So not, you know, covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, so the the nature of of idolatry of worshiping a false god that there's a parallel there which with covetousness okay so that isn't just modern day idolatry that's like what idolatry's always been about idolatry's always been about replacing god with something else that you love more right putting your your love for god upon other things and so when i which is interesting when you look at the false gods they're often gods that are they're really just means to an end so you have like the goddess of, um, and it, and it really parallels, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but you have the goddess of like, of business. Um, you have the goddess or the God of like ocean ventures. And so they're praying to these different gods to get what they want, which is, I want to get across this ocean without crashing my, the ship or hitting a storm. I want to the fish God, I want to offer to the fish God. So when I go fishing, I'll catch my fish. I'm offering to this love God so that I can have this this um, relationship that I'm really desiring, this person I really want. So what's driving people's idolatry is often, I want that God to really serve me. This can become real in your relationship with, with the true God, where God becomes a vending machine. He's an ends to a means. He's the one that gives you what you want. Like, I just, I want 
what I want. God, give me the family I want. Give me the job I want. Give me the health I want. The real purpose is getting the thing from God. It's not God. That is a parallel to idolatry, I think. And I think that modern day idolatry um, is... I would parallel it just the same as the ancient times. There's literal idols going on. And I do think that um, in Roman Catholicism, there is a, it's not a parallel. It is not a parallel. I'm not saying Roman Catholics worship the saints. Some of them do. Okay. Some of them do. And Roman Catholics would agree that some do. But there is something going on here where you have a saint for every need. I have different saints I pray to for different things I want. The patron saint of fill in the blank, right? Where I live, you'll have some Catholics that will like dig holes in their yard and bury the image of a saint in their yard and cover it up with dirt as a way of like protecting the home. That feels a lot like this, this similar type of things that's going on. It's, 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 it's weird. It's weird. Um, so yeah, those are some things that we, we see going on um, that I would parallel with idolatry in the scripture, at least in some, in some respect. You said, I spend way more time on Christian YouTube channels and my phone than I do reading the Bible or praying. Um, okay, so I understand the value of reading your Bible. But I don't think reading your Bible is, is that much different than listening to it online. Nor do I necessarily think listening to a Bible study or someone teaching the word of God is somehow a competition with reading the Bible. It's true that you don't want to lay aside reading scripture. It, the danger here is that you you hear me commenting on the Bible, but you don't actually read it for yourself. So you don't know if I'm taking it out of context. That's a problem. But if your challenge is, um, man, I'm getting so much Christian content, but not as much time reading my Bible and praying. I just want to say you're doing a lot better than most people <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Um, the prayer thing is, is concerning to me for all of us. For all of us, our prayer time, let's be honest, for many of us, our prayer time used to be um, every every time you had nothing else going on, you'd be praying. Like you'd be in the shower and there's nothing else going on, so you're just praying in the shower. And now our phones are soaking up all of our spare time. I do think that's a concern for all of us, for many of us, maybe not for you individually, one of you guys out there, but for a lot of us it is, that we don't lose our prayer time because prayer often fills every empty space that you have and cell phones now fill those empty spaces really well, even when you're filling it with godly content. So don't neglect prayer. That is a real problem. That's something I'm concerned about. Um, and then the last question you said is, do you get concerned that people may idolize you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't really know what I can do about that except for being really honest and real, like mentioning my own limitations. Um, I, I mean, I'm. here's the thing. There are guys like who just, being honest with you guys, who put out vibes. They, where they clearly want you to put them up on a pedestal. It's just obvious. They want to be on a pedestal. It's like it's like where they believe they belong. And I'm trying to not be that guy. Okay, I'm trying to not put out those vibes and to just be honest. Like I, I'd rather you see me as your brother in Christ who has maybe a, a particular gift set and he's trying to live out those gifts really well in you know online um, and to make a lot of content that's going to bless and help people. But I would rather you just personally see me as like a, your brother in Christ. Like you just walk up to me and just talk to me like a normal human being. That's very much how it should be. So yeah, I'm concerned people may idolize me. I, I, my, my bigger question is, am I doing anything that feeds that or am I being proper in my behavior? Um, and do I believe it? Do I believe the, no, I, I'm convinced that all you all think way more highly of me than you should. Just about everybody, right? There are those who think too lowly of me and think too highly of me. And um, I just I just ignore both sides. <laughs> so um, all naps or all naps. I hope that answers your question. Let's see. Tabitha Littman, number nine, says in Mark 7, verses 14 through 19, why does Jesus seem appalled that Jews believe that touching or eating certain things could make them unclean? Given Leviticus 5, verses 2 through 6, and Leviticus 11, speaking of those Leviticus passages that talk about clean and unclean things, this concept came from God, Tabitha says. Let's look at this passage together, shall we? Mark 7, verse 14. It says here, um, and he called the people to him again. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are familiar with the Leviticus section. I don't want to read two full chapters of Leviticus right now, so um, or any section right now for the sake of the speed of our Q&A. Um, but God gave them specific things that are unclean. And he's like, don't touch that. Don't eat that. That's unclean. If you do that, you, you know, you can't be around other people or you can't step into the temple area for a season or those types of things. 
So Mark 7, it says, he called them, called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of him, out of a person, are what defile him. Um, let me just say this. I think Jesus sometimes used rather complex ways of saying things, and he did it on purpose to force us to think. So I think that's happening here, and I'll give you a couple thoughts as to why, but let me read through the rest of the passage. So first off, he says like, you don't get defiled. And remember that word defiled. You don't get defiled by what comes into you, but what goes out of you. And when he entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about this saying, this parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside, that's food and stuff, can't defile him since it enters his heart, not does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Then it has this commentary from Mark. Thus, he declared all foods clean. This is a big deal. Thus, he declared all foods clean. Think about that. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Far for, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So here's the nuance I'll add on top of what I what I see Jesus saying here. In the Old Testament, I don't think the intention was to ever think that unclean foods make you sinful. I think there's a, an idea um, that's being communicated here about ceremonial uncleanness versus straight up sinfulness. So ceremonially, it's unclean. Why? Because I'm trying to draw you a picture. And here's the picture. I'm going to give you the short summary here. You could get into tons of detail. The picture is, I want the Jewish people to realize that God is so holy that if there's any of this uncleanness, you cannot, you cannot draw near him. So I'm going to have you go through all these rituals and all these practices so that you realize the separation there is between you and God. And that separation is then healed by who? By Jesus, the one who's declaring all foods clean. Then we have the new, so there's still sin. Sin is still an issue, but the additional uh, stuff related to ceremonial uncleanness Jesus is not considering that something that defiles you. It may make you ceremonial unclean, but it doesn't defile you. The thing that makes you wicked is your sinfulness, not the ceremonial uncleanness. Now, this is exactly where the Pharisees messed up. They had covetousness in their hearts. They thought it was okay. Like you guys may be familiar with Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager, who says many things that I think are great, he has a teaching on the Ten Commandments and he gets to the commandment on covetousness. I feel like he represents ancient Pharisees here. And he gets to the commandment on covetousness and he suggests that it's okay to covet. You just can't try to take your neighbor's wife. It's okay to covet your neighbor's stuff. You just can't try to take that stuff. That's definitely not the truth about that passage. And it's what Jesus is opposed to as well. Because he says covetousness, that comes from within and defiles you. But Dennis Prager is kind of still stuck in that Pharisee mentality that's going to suggest, that's going to suggest that there's a certain amount of things I'm doing that make my life clean. So in other words, the Pharisees took the law that was meant to show them that they had fallen short of God's glory. They applied the ceremonial parts of the law, but ignored the heart of it. It made them feel they were righteous because they could observe the ceremonies. Jesus comes around and says, oh, you might be ceremonially clean, but you're inwardly defiled by your covetousness and your adulteries and the, the pride and the foolishness, um, all those things that defile you. So I think that that's the context of Jesus that gives it some more nuance. And I do have in my teaching in the gospel of Mark, I have a longer study through this passage that you guys are welcome to check out. I have a playlist on my channel of all the Mark studies, and I hope that helps Tabitha. Um, oh, oh, by the way, finally, moving forward in the, in the gospel and in the timing of the church, when we get to the New Testament, it's like I have a giant... Uh, marshmallow on my thumb, doesn't it? Just like I should just eat it. Um, when we get to the New Testament, we have um, Paul the Apostle making it very clear, Acts 15, making it very clear that the um, that after receiving the gospel, the Gentiles do not have to go back and observe all these clean and unclean laws. So part of it is that Jesus is at the pivot, the pivot, the change between old and new covenant. So he's introducing them to the new covenant here. He's not saying the old is wrong. He's introducing them to the new. That's the difference um, good Christian theology recognizes the old covenant and the law was good and holy and wonderful and right, but also recognizes we're not under it, right? A bad theology would be thinking we're still under it or thinking that it's bad and that's why we're not under it. These are the two errors I often see. All right, so let's let's dig on. Let's keep going. Uh, Joshua Bambrick, question 10 says, it's often said that God 
does not affirm polygamy in the Old Testament. But 2 Samuel 12, 8 seems to refute that. I already know what verse you're, you're thinking of. Why would God give multiple wives to David if he opposes polygamy? Um, okay, so let's go to 2 Samuel 12, 8. This is probably the strongest passage in the Bible for those who want to suggest the Bible supports polygamy. Uh, I'm going to suggest they're drawing too much from the passage, but let's read through it here and let's feel that, that difficulty of the passage pr provides. So this is when um, David is being rebuked because he, remember this story with Bathsheba, He's he's got multiple wives already, David does. Now, he also... Um, uh, sorry, I'm collecting my thoughts and my answers for, for you as I'm talking. Do you ever do that? You're thinking while you're talking. So he has multiple wives. He also then goes on to sleep with Bathsheba, another man's wife. Horrible sin. They commit adultery together. Then to cover it up, he arranges for her husband Uriah to be killed. So this is murder. Okay, this is murder. He just made Joab do it, made somebody else do it. Um, but this is murder. Then Nathan comes and tells him a story that exposes to, to David how wicked he is. And he tells him a story about a man who had all these sheep and he went and stole his neighbor's only sheep that he loved and he killed it so he could cook it and feed it to his guests. And David gets infuriated and then he's like, that guy's gonna die. I can't believe he had all the sheep and he did that. And then Nathan turns to him and he says, you think that guy should die? He says to David, you are the man. David, you're the guy. You're the man who took the man who only had one wife. You're the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. Um, now we know we, we have no record. Let me, I'm just gonna start unpacking the answer to your questions here. We have no record of David sleeping with Saul's wives. Um, this is very possibly a phrase that just means that they were in his care. Um, the reason why that's important is because in their culture, when one, um, when one person took over the kingdom of another person, they would often try to still keep the, the wives of that king in the home or in the castle or in the proximity of the original guy. It gave more credibility to his rulership. Okay, so, so there's no record of David having done anything with them. Um, that we should just acknowledge. Now you could try to read it into it if you want, but you're reading, you're adding stuff into it. Then he says, and if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. He would add more. And here's where the, the challenge is going to come. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Um, now in pagan cultures, I, I think that the king would be able to do that, but not, not, in God's mind. Okay. So now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he, and he shall lie with your wives in the, in the sight of the sun. Um, this is not, okay. This is what's going to happen. It's a consequence. It is not something that God's like, I love when this happens. This happens frequently with judgment in the old Testament. Where God says like, um, in fact, I had someone tell me the Bible teaches uh, cannibalism and it's because in scripture, God tells the people, if you don't turn to me, you will starve and you'll be eating each other. Like this is the consequence of your sin. You'll have famine. You'll be, there'll be a siege around you and in sieges, they would just wait you out. You'll run out of food. You'll be eating each other. And this person quoted this as if this judgment was something that God likes or wants, right? This is not something God, it's not, it's not God's approval on these things, obviously. For you did, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. So the specific verse that the question arises from, uh, let me find your question again here, uh, Josh. It's Joshua. It's from verse eight, you said. And this is this thing. I think I highlighted it when I went through it. I would add to you as much more. Um. The idea is, look, you've got, you've got all these things. I would have given you much more. Is God suggesting he would have given David more wives? That, that God would have just provided with David with more wives? Or is this a way of, of God, and I'm going to argue for this, that it's a way of God simply saying, I, could, I, I would have given you so many more things without you stealing and taking and killing. Uh, but is God actually suggesting wives? I think the answer is probably no, and I'm going to support that 
I, I can understand how somebody would think that is in this passage. Um, but I'm going to support this here with the rest of what God says about kings and wives. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, it says about kings, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excess silver and gold. So God specifically forbids the idea of kings acquiring lots of wives. Uh, I think New King James puts multiply wives. He's, you can't get a bunch of wives. Kings, you're not allowed to do this. It's a normal thing. It's what kings always did. So what is God saying to David here? I think he's basically saying, David, whatever you want, I could have been the source for you of godly things and good things and good ways. I do think it's worded strangely. I admit that. But I think if we look at consistency with other places like Deuteronomy 17, 17, then we see that this is not God going, oh, I would happily give you, like really literally give you 50 or 100 wives. God specifically says, you can't do that. You don't do that. This is wrong. I don't want the kings to do that. So I think we have to be misunderstanding God in that case. Um, there's my thought on that. And I do think that God opposes polygamy. I think it starts in Genesis. And I think Jesus argues that God opposes polygamy as well in the Gospels. And I've talked about that in my marriage and divorce series. If you t actually type Mike Winger polygamy, you will see a couple videos pop up for more details on that. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a phrase, a figure of speech. It's a way of God saying, I would provide for you. I would take care of you. I would give you so many things. And that you went and took wrongly. And um, he gets rebuked for that. Where are we now? Question number 11. Joanne Garibay says, Were angels created on day one with the heavens and all hosts in them? Nehemiah 9 through 6. You put 9-6. Genesis 1 is not as clear. Are the hosts the angels? I think you might have met Nehemiah 9, 6, 9 verse 6. Let me just look real quick and see uh, what it says here. Nehemiah 9. So first off, background for you guys. Genesis 1 doesn't tell us when the angels were made. Right? It just doesn't tell us when they were made. Then Nehemiah 9, 6, it says, You are the Lord, you alone. You made the heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Uh, the, the fact that host of heaven is used in a worshipful sense, it may imply that this host is our, our angels, right? Could we talk about stars? Could we talk about angels? Sometimes you, you can't tell what a verse is referring to. Clearly, God made the angels. That much we know. I would actually say Job gives us um, another... Um, another verse that we could look at, and it's Job 38, verse 7. Sorry, I have to go to it this way. 38, 7. There we go. Now look at Job. It's poetry here, right? But he's talking about the creation time. And he mentions the angels doing something during creation, which is interesting to me. So Job 38, he talks about God and God made all the things like, you know, actually, excuse me, it's God speaking. Where were you? God says to Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. What we're getting here is a description of what, now it's super poetic, this whole section in Job, super, super, super poetry here. But it's it's telling us what the angels were doing during the time of creation. And I don't want to press literalism too far on a very poetic passage, right? Like in the same passage, he says he shut the sea in with doors. Okay, so if like you're a flat earther looking for Job 38 for like, yes, there's like, there's like the, the corners were sank and the bases and the cornerstone. It's like these are these are symbolic terms of building things. He also shuts doors in the seas. Okay, the ocean's not closed with doors, right? This is all poetry here. But the implications of the angels are already around when creation happens. So my thought is, at least unless I have reason to think otherwise, that the angels were there during the creation time in Genesis 1. That at whatever point at which they were made, they were they were watching the forming of the earth. Like by Genesis 1 verse 2, it seems like we have angels present. They're delighting in what God's doing. Um, th that would be my my thought on that. And I hope you find it helpful. Does that, When did God make the angels? Well, he just doesn't tell us. Um, he just doesn't tell us. There's plenty we don't know about that stuff, unfortunately. David Dufty, question number 12, says, When discussing correcting each other in Bible studies... And he mentions Galatians 6, 1 and Matthew 18, 15. People mostly focus on when or why we shouldn't admonish someone. Why does loving and appropriate dis discipline look like? What does loving and appropriate discipline look like? Yeah, um, maybe it's our culture. 
Um, and I'm speaking of my own culture here. Look, here I live here in Southern California. This is my culture that I'm in is that correcting people is uh, hated. <laughs> it's offensive and um, you lose friends. And so we find reasons not to do it. But here's emphasis on when to do it from the passages you're referring to. So Matthew 18, 15 gives us an instruction. First off, Matthew 18 has nothing. People like to quote this passage to tell me I can't like refute a false teacher online. Oh, yes, I can. And I will. And I'm going to do it again in a few days here. <laughs> um, but um, but that's appropriate, entirely right. I think I'm honoring God by doing that and helping people and hopefully even helping the false teacher. Although, let's be honest, my real emphasis is on the people he's influencing, not him. But um, but Matthew 18 is not about that. This is a scenario of if your brother sins against you. So the first thought is this. When somebody wounds you, then go and tell them. Now, this does not mean you're offended at somebody. Somebody offends you. It doesn't say that. Right, You being offended doesn't mean you're sinned against. This is a modern cultural glitch we're having right now. To think that if I'm offended, I've been sinned against. Um, it, you may be true. You might be sinned against. You might not be. Uh, so it's not that. It's if they sin against you. And obviously, it would be a significant sin, something significant, not just like they looked at you funny or something. But if they sin against you significantly, then your relationship is damaged. So what? Go and tell him his fault and do it between you and him alone. Because private discussions like that are more fruitful than public ones. So you go between the two of you alone. And the whole goal here, the agenda is gaining your brother back, gaining your brother back. So yes, one time when you should go talk to somebody is when their sin is against you personally, and it's damaged your relationship, and you want to restore that relationship. It's weird and selfless that God has asked us to be the ones who are sinned against that are trying to fix the relationship. But that is this is something that I think we miss. I'm the one that was hurt. Yes. And you go talk to them and try to restore that relationship. But don't just sugarcoat it. Tell them what happened. And the goal here is restoration. But it's interesting that often we think, well, they sinned against me. They have to come to me. And God flips this because he's trying to heal our relationships. He knows how easily we get broken, how fragile our relationships are. And so we're, we're meant to try to restore them. That's, that's I think, what scripture is telling us. And if you don't like me because of what scripture says here... Um, Okay. Galatians 6.1, for anybody out there, he's like, I don't like this. The onus is on me. Um, yeah. This doesn't mean if, if, if someone's like, they, 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 they tried to murder you and then you're like, go privately tell them. And I'm like, no, this is obviously not wise, right? You don't, I'm going to go have a quiet one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who's trying to kill me last time. Like, obviously there's wisdom that must be carried into these situations. The general rule is we seek restoration. And we look at individual situations. Situations of repeated ongoing abuse are obviously a, a different scenario. Galatians 6 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, boom, totally different scenario. The first scenario, Matthew, is they sin against me. The Galatian scenario is they're, they themselves are caught up in a sin. I'm not even involved. They're just caught in a sin. You, you could say they've fallen, they're backslidden. Something has really messed up their walk with Christ. Solution You who are spiritual, should restore him. That's the solution. And again, the onus ends up being on the person who's not in sin. It's it's the one who sees it happening, who has that healthy spiritual mindset, and it's on you to go to your brother and seek him out. Like they're the sheep that are wandering, and we're we're among the ninety nine. And yes, Jesus goes, he leaves the ninety nine, but he trains the ninety nine to be like that too. You guys go and you get the one that's wandering. Go and get them and, re and restore them. Your whole goal, your whole agenda, everything you do in this regard is to restore them. You're not trying to prove you're right. You're not trying to prove they're wrong. You're trying to help them get out of that sin and be restored to God. Do it in a spirit of gentleness. You're not meant to be harsh. You, so immediately tone down how harsh you want to be. Immediately dial off how strongly you want to word your sentences. Add grace to the thing you're saying. Uh, that Obviously, this is a tendency of ours. Um, okay, when I'm going to tell you about your sin, I'm going to do it like in a blunt fashion. It's like add a lot of grace in there, add a lot of kindness in there, let them feel it. And then watch out for yourself, right? Because you too can fall into sin in this whole situation where you're trying to correct others. So in what I'm going to say here, um, David Duff, Dufty, is that the emphasis in Galatians 6, different scenarios, right? Someone's in sin, someone sinned against me. But the emphasis in Galatians and Matthew is the same. It's actually meant to motivate us to go out and do something. It's not to keep us from doing it. 
We're supposed to go out and try to restore relationships. But our tendency in our culture is to just sort of build walls and just, okay, that person's just gone from my life now. Okay, now that person's gone from my life. Okay, that person's gone. And this is not healthy for the body of Christ. So we do need to get biblical about all that. Gabriel Martinez says, how can I love myself biblically? Any advice or scripture? I feel like I hate myself sometimes. Uh, thank you for your job. Your videos are a blessing. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, so this one, I, I, I do have an opinion about generally speaking. As a youth minister, I've done a lot of youth ministry. And I've dealt with a lot of young people who've said, I hate myself. And in my experience, there's a commonality that may not be true for everyone who says this. But it's true for a lot of people who say this. And this is, again, this is my experience. My experience is that when people say, I hate myself, it's a way of distancing themselves from their problems so that it's no longer me doing bad things and I'm upset about it. And now it's some, it, me is like this other, this other thing other than me that's doing the bad things. And I look at myself as though I'm the victim of me and I hate me for how much I keep messing me up. It's a way per perhaps of, and here's the danger here. I'm giving, shoot, I'm shooting straight with you. <laughs> I think the danger is we don't take responsibility for our actions because we act like our actions aren't things we're doing. They're being done to us. So I'm othering myself so I can hate myself. So I can feel sorry for myself. So I can feel bad in a guilt, in a, um, in a victim mentality instead of bad in a repenting mentality. That's my fear that goes on here. And I don't know how well I am at communicating it to other people, but this is kind of what I observe and what I think is happening here. I would recommend that um, this is what we see with Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, the, um, the thing that Cain does in his whole discussion with God, he murders his brother, right? And then he's like, oh, this is going to be too hard for me. And he gets victim mentality right away. It's oh, whoever finds you going to kill me. He's not even showing repentance. Right? He just feels bad for the situation that he put himself in as if it wasn't him doing it. And so it's weird. It's weird. He sees grace even as something that's like wasn't good enough for him. So I think this victim mentality thing can be pretty bad. Um, guilt is very unpleasant. And the guilt of dealing with our sin, we, we mismanage it sometimes. We, we project our guilt onto others. This is where somebody, um, like you read about David's, David's family and you have one of his sons, raping one of his daughters, their, their, their half siblings. And it says he loved her, right? He loved her. He, he says he loves her. I love her. I love her. I love her. And then he rapes her. And the next thing it says is that he hated her. Why do you hate someone you love so much? Because you're, you're putting the guilt of your sin on her. So you hate her instead of feeling bad and really repenting. Um, I say all that to say sometimes hatred of self is a unhealthy way of managing guilt that turns me into a victim instead of someone who has to actually deal with it and repent. But it's complicated. I fully acknowledge it's complicated. So how do you love yourself biblically in that sense? I would say you already love yourself. The Bible does just take for granted that you love yourself. For instance, if you really, really hated somebody and you heard that they were starving, you really truly hated them, right? You'd be happy. Like if that was real hatred, you'd be happy they were starving. If you heard that their girlfriend dumped them, you'd be happy. But you're never happy when those things happen to you, right? If your girlfriend dumps you, you're not like, yes, good. That, I, that guy deserves it. I hate him. That's not really hate. That's not hate. There's something else going on here. There's something confusing going on here. So my thought is you do care about yourself, Gabriel. You do. You do. You're dealing with all kinds of issues. And I would recommend Jesus is the only solution to your guilt. Coming to him, knowing this, he will and can forgive you right now. Turn your heart to Christ today. Face be bold, step forward, and as ugly as it is, face your own issues and know this, Jesus died for that too. There is hope for you, right? Don't, don't have hate, have hope. Don't have that victim, hopeless mentality. Instead, think it can change right now today. It can change right now today through Christ, through trusting in him, and through walking according to his commands and just actually making the changes that I know I need to make this whole time. That's my encouragement to you. And I know, let me say, after saying all that, I know there's things I haven't talked about. I don't even know you, Gabriel, right? I, I, I'm not, I'm not psychically seeing into your life. Uh, none of that's happening here. I'm talking about experiences I've had in the past. And I'm hoping that what I've learned from those people might apply to your life. So not, no judgments on you here. I just hope that this is somehow fruitful for you. Um, 
yeah, those are those are my encouragements. Um, now, if you're dealing with uh, thinking you're you're lesser than everybody else and all that kind of thing, I would just say everyone's lesser than you think. <laughs> We're all wicked, but we're also all made in the image of God. And human humankind is like um, um, the most, in a sense, it's like one of the most, we, we've got to be in all of creation, the most beautiful thing God ever made. We're made in his image. And then we've taken that beautiful thing and we've done wicked things with it. So we're a mixed bag. We're, we're, we're amazing and we're disgusting. We're beautiful and we're horrific. And that's, the, that, that's what, that's why we need Jesus. All right, Jackson has a question. Jackson Starrett says, most of my friends and family are atheists and don't take any argument for God seriously. How could I reach them in a way that they would listen and start to take Christianity seriously as a topic? Um, I, I mean, I would say, Jackson, I, obviously I don't know your situation. Um, I don't know them personally. Um, it's, it's especially tough with family because family can dismiss your arguments because they know you, right? Not because your arguments are actually bad. Like they just, they know you. And, and I see this a lot with family. Jesus says a prophet's not without honor except in his own home. There's, there's a sense in which the people who know us the most underestimate us the most. And that happens pretty regularly. Now, as a, as a leader in the church, I always try to like have a lot, like tell myself, have hope about the people that serve in your own church, have high expectations, high hopes for them lest you fall into the same trap of, oh, I know them, they would never be able to do that. Um, those things aren't true. So your family may be doing this to you, which with, that might mean, Jackson, that they're just not going to listen to you, that it might be that they need somebody else. So like, perhaps you could redirect them to some other source that might actually pierce through to them. Find somebody you think atheists listen to who gets through to them and then try to get your family to pay attention to that source. That might be one approach to take because it could be personal about you. Yeah, um... Otherwise, I would just say, you know, pray that God gives you wisdom on how to approach these issues. Know that your success does not depend on their being their minds being changed. Your success is in faithfully representing Christ, whether or not anyone responds. That's where success is for the Christian. And yeah, so God give you wisdom. Lucas Eileen says, what is a biblical perspective on married believers using birth control or permanent measures? Um, like a vasectomy. I heard some say there's there's... Some say no, based on Genesis 38, Psalm 139. Um, okay, well, look, children are a blessing. Okay, they are a blessing. Um, I think Genesis 38 is the situation where there was a man who refused to get his wife pregnant and God killed him. Okay, but this this is a little, there's a little more to it than that. <laughs> so if there's a story here that is we learn from, um, I, but if that's the passage you're thinking of, I, I would say... Um, that we, we don't want to stretch this too much, right? We're going, our, okay, our Bible study skills are suffering. If we take an instance that happened once and we make it a rule about all of life for all of mankind, okay, that can be a problem. That can be a problem. So, um, so yeah, what we get from that passage is that this man had a moral obligation to raise up a kid to his in the name of his his brother who died. And he's sleeping with that man. This is levy rate marriage back in the day. And he's he's taken her as a wife after he has, his brother died. And, he, and the first kid is supposed to be raised up to his brother's name so that the land that belonged to his brother goes to that kid. This man won't produce a child with her so he can keep the land for himself. He wants his brother to have no heir, robbing her of children, robbing his brother of an heir. This is not the situation of just children in general. So what do I think about it? Um, I think that um, what's clear as a Christian is w once a life begins, that you forcefully stopping it is is killing and murder and wrong. Okay, so all uh, abortifacients, so that would be a lot of birth controls actually kill a fertilized egg, a baby, a little tiny human. That would be wrong. That'd be morally wrong. Other ones prevent conception from happening. And I don't have a strong Christian statement to tell you that that can't happen, that you can't do that. I think that people have been doing it forever. I think that for families back in Abraham's day, they might have said, all right, we've had enough kids. Let's not have any more. Or I don't know if my wife is healthy enough to go through another labor. Let's just do family planning. We'll just not be together during that time of the month. And they're smart enough to figure that out. They're not morons back then. Just because they don't have cell phones doesn't mean they're fools. 
um, sometimes it's the other way around, right? So, um, so yeah, that being said, uh, children are a blessing. Children are good. If, if, if a family doesn't want to have kids and they don't want to have kids because of selfish motives and ungodly desires, then those are the, those are the problems, the root of the problems. Um, oh, I just want to be able to go on vacation all the time and have no responsibility. So those are the things I would want to focus on. Um, but yeah, like if, if a, if a husband gets a vasectomy after him and his wife have had three kids, I don't, I don't think that that's a moral thing that I would say Christians can't do. I would just leave it to that family to decide what they want to do. But that's not an abortion. That's not a uh, killing a, a, a baby. So that's a different scenario. Brian Harper says, question 16, why would a God who hates evil place evil incarnate Satan into the garden when the world was still good and sinless, knowing that it would lead to the corruption of humans? Um, so Brian, I don't think Satan is evil incarnate. Um, I don't think anything is evil incarnate. Um, Satan's evil, but I don't think evil has an incarnation in that sense. So I do think Satan's bad, right? Satan's bad. Um, why would God, you said he places evil in the garden. I mean, Satan went to the garden. We don't know how he got there. We don't know if that, what the story is behind that. So I don't know. We might, might be assuming a lot there. Uh, the way the question is worded, I'm noticing elements. Okay. Saying that God placed him in the garden when we don't know that saying that Satan's evil incarnate, which is an exaggeration. Um, and calling the world good and sinless, knowing that it, Satan, is what led to the corruption of humans. All those things are elements I would disagree with. Okay, so Satan's not evil incarnate. Uh, God didn't place Satan in the garden. I mean, he could if he wanted to, but I don't see that in the text, unless I missed something. Um, the it that led to the corruption of humans was not Satan. It was the free will choice of Adam and Eve. One of the factors was Satan. I absolutely agree there. But... Let's say that you go out right now and somebody offers you drugs, a dealer offers you drugs and you take the drugs and you shoot them up and you end up overdosing and killing yourself. And let's say that you then stand before God and you say to God, why did you put that drug dealer there knowing that I was going to use drugs if he offered them to me? What have I done is I've found a way to avoid my personal responsibilities here. I'm not responsible. God your environment that you created is responsible, but this ignores the most important aspect of the garden, and that's the free will of mankind to choose to rebel against God. So yeah, there was possible temptations, but there was a free will decision that was made. I think that's hugely important, and I think that changes the... the so in other words, I, I go, your question doesn't, it doesn't work. It didn't lead to the corruption of humans. Satan didn't lead. Um, and it may have happened that they would have eaten of the tree without Satan being there. You don't know that they wouldn't either. So we're just assuming too much as a way of kind of making God the bad guy, which to me, um, there are those who would suggest that, that if God does this, he's the bad guy. I think this is one of the craziest things I've ever heard. I, I'm, I don't entertain the idea, like not just because I'm religious, like it's philosophically gobbledygook to me to say that God did something wrong. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. So rehashing and restating biblical stories in a way that makes God look like a bad guy is only trying to deliberately get the wrong impression from reality. Like I, I don't understand this approach and that's why I'm not super sympathetic to it, I guess. So sorry, <laughs> those are my thoughts. Um, Robo King number 17 says, Hey, Pastor Mike, in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus told his 12 disciples that they will have 12 thrones of judgment to judge the 12 tribes in the future. Does Judas still have a throne? Man, I've wondered this myself. Like I, every time I read this passage, so let's look at it together. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus is, obviously he's got the 12 and we know, everybody knows who the 12 are. The 12 definitely includes Judas. Um, so that's interesting, right? This is, this is, um, um, let me try to look at a little bit more context here. Um, yeah, so this is, this is right after the rich young ruler, the rich man is talking to Jesus about following him and all that. And Jesus is like, sell all that you have. And so in other words, this is before the cross, right? Ju Judas has not betrayed Jesus. He's still one of the 12. And then here in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So... How does that work if Judas is one of them? Well, you could simply say that, here's here's a couple answers. You could simply say, Judas is just replaced by Matthias or some would argue by Paul. And so yes, 
The 12 who follow him will sit on 12 thrones, but Judas officially stopped being one of the 12. So when they said the 12 afterwards, they no longer referred to Judas. So there still are the 12 who followed him. Well, how does that, how is that consistent? Well, even when they picked Matthias in Acts chapter one, they only allowed people to be chosen to replace Judas if they had followed Jesus the entire three years of his ministry from the baptism of John up until his crucifixion. And so Matthias was around. He was following that whole time. So then he was then the replacement for Jesus. So, okay, that could actually work. That could actually work. Um, another way to look at it is that Jesus is just not being literal here. He doesn't mean um, you uh, will sit on 12 literal thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Like they're, they don't have to be 12 literal thrones. It could be symbolic of the authority they will have. Okay, are there going to be 12 thrones? Um, another thing you could add is he doesn't say the 12 apostles. He just says, you who followed me. So I just, I never really thought about that before. I just noticed it right now as I'm looking at the passage. You who have followed me. Let me look at the parallel passage because he, he doesn't say it's the 12. He just says you who follow me, which would be true about Matthias or anybody that was potentially anybody that was there. Um, Yeah, the, the, the closest parallel that I immediately find is the discussion on who's the greatest. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at a table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, I mean, he's clearly talking to the 12 here, but probably not only the 12. It might be that Jesus left these statements slightly fuzzy because Judas wasn't going to be one of them in the end. That might actually be a case for the cleverness of Christ. <laughs> Interesting. All right, um, next question, number 18. Taylor Paris says, Hi, Mike, what does God, why does God repeatedly declare that he's the only Savior in Isaiah? And he says he knows of no rock. This was confusing because Jesus is said to be a rock. Thanks. Well, Taylor, I think it's because Jesus is God. <laughs> That's why. So there is no other Savior. There is no other rock. Um, I think Jesus is Savior and he is rock. There is only one God but three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. So when Jesus shows up, he's not only man, but he's also God from eternity. I think the answer here is, is the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. That's why there's no other rock. Um, that's why he, That's why God can say in Isaiah, the past same, in the 40s, Isaiah in the 40s is this very monotheistic rant of the, of the Old Testament, right? And in there, he's like, uh, he alone laid the foundations of the earth. He says he did it alone. Alone meaning without help, right? He did it alone. And what's interesting then is that in the scripture, it says that Jesus was also there by, by him, all things were made through him, by him and through him. So how does that work? Well, because God, God with only himself, he's alone in the sense there's no one else, no other beings, but father, son, and spirit, all three persons are there at the creation moment. The father, the son, and the spirit, all, you know, acting in different fashions, I think at that time. But I think that again, these riddles are answered by the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Great question. And an and easy one <laughs> for me. Jilly Bean has a question. Mike, hola from Finland. From, wait, in Finland, do you say hola? Do you say hola or is it hola? Is it H-O-L-A? I'm just, so I'm near Mexico here. We're pretty close to Mexico. So, you know, hola is kind of like something we say a lot around here. But um, is that is that a Finnish word too? Can you explain to me what the narrow gate means in Matthew 7 verses 13 to 14, what it means in practice? Matthew 7, 13. Let's read it together and talk about it. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those enter, who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, often this is taken to be a passage that in practicality reveals that, the, that, that those who will receive salvation will be the minority as opposed to the majority. And that may be the case. It's entirely possible. Um, um, 
that that's that that's exactly what Jesus means here. He's like, few are actually receiving it. Now, you could say that he's he's saying that it's happening like right at the moment. Jesus is out there preaching the gospel and few are accepting it. Few are receiving it. Many are rejecting his teachings. Um, now, some would try to make this a workspace thing. And they would say, enter, the, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate. And the way is easy, the least the destruction. And the idea here that they would have is this is like something you have to labor at. So you have to do something. It's really, really hard for you. You have to like um, work really hard to get saved. So this would not only be work salvation, but it would be like next level work salvation. It'd be like, not only do you have to work really hard to be saved, but most people aren't going to be good enough. They're not going to labor hard enough to get saved. I think that they're just taking the words of Jesus um, out of out of context to be used for their work salvation thing. And that happens a lot with the words of Christ. People who quote them, uh, isolated passages to try to promote a works salvation type thing. So, yeah, I think the uh, the main focus here, in my opinion, off the cuff, your quick answer you give to me. Um, yeah, the, these are all just isolated sayings. Here we are, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He just gives a saying after saying after saying. There's a lot of like, quick pithy sayings so this one may just stand by itself enter by the narrow gate um he also goes on to say that he is the way he is the truth so i think that it's it's entering by the hard and difficult teachings of christ even though that's not acceptable to most people yeah and the way of life that he he guides us to i think that's a simple understanding of it yeah and if people want to bring in the works question uh, does that mean i have to like labor for something i don't think jesus is answering that question here I think he's talking more about the general reception people have to the teachings of Christ. There are the majority who reject and, and the minority who accept. And our last question for today from Audrey Addison, question 20 says, there have been cases of people that live with only half a brain. Does someone that has had the connection between the halves of their brain removed and now have two consciousnesses, have two souls? Audrey, Audrey you, you win. You stumped me. <laughs> um, I've only read, I read an article on this a long time ago, I think. I might have seen a little video about somebody's life about going through this stuff. I don't know nearly enough about it to answer those questions. These are deep questions. They're tough questions. Um, and they're just, it's just over my head. You could, you could split my brain in half and put each half to the task and I still might not come up with an answer even after a long time. I know, it's <coughs> terrible terrible lame joke. Um, so I'm sorry, Audra, I don't know the right answer. But what I can tell you guys is that challenging questions, we can let them be challenging. This isn't, it's not like I, you have to know the answer to everything. And we should, even as pastors, even as people who are trying to answer questions, we should limit ourselves to the things we actually have reasons to believe. Now, I just want to remind you guys that this is what's coming pretty soon here in like a week, maybe less. I'm going to be dealing with the Jesus was a racist video by Brandon Robertson. And I'm not only going to deal with this, I'm going to also deal with his teaching um, on truth. He has a whole, basically he has his whole theology because I looked into his videos. His whole theology is based on some really, really weird, but obviously false teachings. And I think that it'd be really helpful to get that out there. This is what I talk about when I say I'm worried about progressive Christianity. Oh, there it is. <laughs> this guy. Okay, and, and these things that are, there's no care or concern for the truth of Christ. There's care for taking Jesus and reshaping him into the image of our current culture. In this case, a woke Jesus. Look, I don't want a Republican Jesus. I don't want a Democrat Jesus. I want Jesus. And I definitely don't want the radically altered version of Christianity that is being presented by guys like Brandon Robertson. And I pray they'd repent, but so many people have been after him for so long to do it. I'm more interested in just stopping others from falling down the pit that he is uh, pretending is a pillar. So we're going to be doing that pretty soon. And I also want to let you guys know, I've put a link down in the video description to a video that's about to go live in like 45 minutes, less than that, I think, um, 35 minutes on Inspiring Philosophy's channel. And it's about evidence for the Exodus. So if you still have time and you wanna check it out, he's done a ton of research. I watched the video ahead of time. I thought it was really well done about evidence that the Israelites really were in Egypt, that they really did, the Exodus really happened, including this really interesting stuff about a large amount of graves related to the Passover lambs, potentially. Very interesting stuff. So you can check that out. Otherwise, Lord bless you and keep you. And keep your eyes on him and remember, 
the works we're called to do as Christians are amazingly high. The lifestyle we're called to live is ridiculously high. But the way that we maintain our salvation is by purely the grace of Christ. So yes, we have a high calling, but we have entire oceans of grace that sustain us. And it is simply by abiding in Christ that that fruit comes in our lives. And I hope that that encouragement would stick with you. I will see you on Monday.